the time has come to give a talk. <laughs> yeah, time just come and goes. So, um, um, <coughs> another Dharma talk. Okay. People come in, yeah, more people coming in. Maybe more, roll up, roll up this way, Dharma talk. No extra charge. Very good. So, during most of the talks, which I have given here, mostly been about. Um, Wow, it's amazing. As soon as I open my mouth, I went back in. <coughs> Has been about meditation. And yeah, I think it was also important I do talk about the deep meditations because you hear about them and you argue about them and you want to know what the right thing is about these meditations. So it's wonderful to be able to have a little um, practice and see if it works. And, one day it does work for you, nothing to be afraid of, wonderful uh, way of meditating. And it gives you so much peace and happiness and joy and freedom. But one example of uh, what the meditation path is, is again, using stories. When I was 17, I went to United States, I'd already got my place in university and it wasn't like a gap year, it was only a gap nine months. So I had a place there but I couldn't go up there until I was 18 so I decided to go first of all to North Africa with my guitar and a sleeping bag. <coughs> a guitar which I couldn't play but nevertheless <laughs> it looked good. It was part of the uniform. <laughs> Uh, beat me, come hippie. But anyway, when I got back from there, and then I went over to the United States. I was really bored in the United States, just the same as anywhere else. And so I remember going to a library and just seeing these, uh, the jungles in Central America, and especially in the Yucatan Peninsula, because there were these old pyramids. No one knew sort of what they were really meant to, to signify in the middle of the jungle. And I thought, wow, that's really cool to go into the jungles of the Yucatan Peninsula in Guatemala in search of... Um, there's a movie about that, wasn't it? About uh, Indiana Jones. I wasn't Indiana Jones, I was Shepherd's Bomb Peter. <coughs> Shepherd's Bush Peter. <laughs> Not Indiana Jones. <laughs> It doesn't really have the same ring to it, Indiana Jones and Shepherd's Bush Pete. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there I went there. But it was, it was really was a trek to get there. And I got to Guatemala City, but then you had to go down to the coastline. And when you go to the coast, get a fishing boat which left at midnight and along the Caribbean coastline. Actually, maybe one or two o'clock in the morning when it really left. But one thing which I discovered, you know, your own experiences, to actually to witness the, the dawn, the sunrise over the Caribbean coast, that was just such a beautiful sunrise. I was really tired, really wanted to sleep, but just couldn't. Because the beauty was just, I can't miss this. And I often found that sleepiness, if you're really enjoying what you're doing, you get lots of energy, you just, you can't sleep. You don't want to sleep, you don't want to miss this. And much of tiredness, you know, it can be boredom. Life is not so interesting for you. And it's, you know, life can be a bit boring and, and struggling, but there's so much beauty in life, there's so much wonder in life, so much incredible things which you can see. But I don't know why it is that people keep focusing on the, the bad stuff. Even when we remember past memories, I'm remembering lovely memories here, when you remember bad memories, why do you do that? <coughs> you know, sometimes I go to people's houses, you know, who are visiting this and chanting or doing something there, and I often notice the, the photos on the wall, or on these sort of the desk or whatever they have these, usually family photos. They have the time when maybe they they got married, they have the time when they graduated. 
you know, big smiles on their faces when they're on, on holiday you know, in some exotic location have all those wonderful happy photographs on their wall but I've never ever seen someone put on their wall a photograph of them when they were studying late at night in order to revise for their exams to get their degree <laughs> I've never seen them anywhere <coughs> marriages, yes, I don't see anyone the marriage of the divorce when it was finally finalised in the court I don't have a picture of that on the wall <laughs> I haven't seen them stuck in the London traffic at rush hour I only went on holiday in some beautiful location <laughs> I had seen them just playing games with their children and their family, never went in the hospital bed sick. Why is that? It's because we want to keep the happy photographs in sight, in view, to cheer us up, to make us feel happy. But why is it that the photograph albums outside are always enjoyable, uplifting? The photograph albums we keep between our two ears, <laughs> they're all the rubbish. He said this, she did that, that was not fair, I got hurt, this was cruel. All of that sort of stuff. Why do we actually think like that? You know, sometimes people would ask me why I became a monk, and sometimes I tell them, it was because when I was young, I fell in love. And when I fell in love, six months of happiness, and then she dubbed me for another guy. And I became a monk to forget. <coughs> <laughs> you don't believe me? Well, it could be the case, because I forgot all about it. <laughs> so it worked. It's logically consistent. <laughs> you become a monk to figure, I don't remember anything like that. So it worked. <laughs> but why is it we keep the hurt instead of keeping the, the happiness? It doesn't make any sense to me. So there is. You know, computers are really good. You learn a lot from computers. You know, you have a, my favourite button on the computer delete. I love that button, delete. <coughs> In fact, it's probably the one which is really worn out. Yeah, don't like that, delete. That email, nah, delete. <laughs> <laughs> that invitation, nah, delete. And when they complained to me, they said, why didn't you respond to me? They said, well, you know, you haven't got enough good karma, delete. <laughs> <laughs> I love my delete part because that's Buddhist, delete. It means let go. So, <laughs> delete, 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 delete. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, when I, the, the nice stuff, the memory of just uh, on this fishing boat going up the Caribbean coast, it's gorgeous sunrise, never seen one like that before. I remember that. And then going up this river, like a real rainforest river, it's, uh, seeing indigenous people coming, just bare in a dugout canoe, I thought, wow, this is just like being Tarzan. Because those days I didn't know about um, Shepherd's Bush Pete, otherwise known as Indiana Jones. I just thought this was really cool, like Tarzan. The Tarzan is going to come, come swinging out of the jungle at any moment. <coughs> and then eventually, just at the end of the river, you know, it took all day getting on a, a truck, on the back of a truck, through the jungles. It took about two or three days to get to this uh, archaeological site called Tikal. And the important point was, it took me so long to get there, because if I'd have just flown in some aircraft, I wouldn't have had the experience. If ever you had the privilege, good fortune, to go in a rainforest, a real rainforest, you'll find that no matter what tracks, maybe uh, bulldoze or cut through the forests, no matter what rivers, uh, you travel on. That rainforest is so alive that the trees and the branches, they soon cover over any space in the forest canopy. 
So if I did look up, all I'd see is just little um, holes in the canopy which, uh, through which the light um, uh, came down on where I was. You never saw the sky. You never saw the distance. You're inside a jungle, travelling through tunnels like some underground maze. And when I finally got to the uh, archaeological site called Tikal, the Mayan civilization, no one knows exactly why it sort of uh, disappeared. And no one knew what these big pyramids in the jungle were for. But as soon as I saw one, there was only one other person around the place, some archaeologist messing around, didn't concern about me. And I had my little uh, rickshaw driver who was just asleep. And so I decided to climb one of those pyramids. And I often tell people, why, why, do, why do you climb a pyramid for? Why? And I often say, because it's a boy thing. <laughs> you know, we see something, we want to climb it. I don't know why, but you know, maybe in our genes or something. Anyway, not these days, no, because I'm just too fat and old to climb stuff. <laughs> but anyway, you climbed it, see what's up the top there. Without knowing at all what I'd find, <coughs> without having done any study, sometimes study and knowledge can stand in the way of truth. That's one of my other sayings, never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth. Because all the stuff we know, we've learnt, this can't be right, but it's right in front of you. So, follow the truth rather than your learning. Learning is good, but sometimes it blocks you seeing something, yeah, something more truthful than anything your knowledge has given to you. So never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth. And so I got up the top there because I didn't have much learning. When I got to the top there, it was so obvious <coughs> someone who hadn't done any study on that civilization, what those pyramids were there for. First of, <coughs> first of all, on top of that pyramid, at last there was a wind, a nice breeze coming. Because in the jungle it was just so hot and humid, the air never flowed through the jungle, it was too thick. If you go on the top above the jungle, there's this beautiful breeze blowing over the tree canopies, because at the top of that pyramid, it was just above the, uh, the height of the trees. So, first of all, it was so cool up there, so pleasant, you could actually cool off. And also, when you got to the top there, you could look down, and it took a whole day to get from this, this little village called Flores, a very delightful village, it was in the middle of a lake, in the middle of the Yucatan Peninsula. Flores obviously means flowers. And anyway, that when I, amazing it took that long to get that short distance, because when you're on top, it was like Google Maps, bird's eye view. And so, when I saw that, wow, I could see all the, the little roads and the winding paths, the places where you cross the river. All of that you could see from high up. You could see your world. And you could see just how it all fits together. And then, even better, instead of just seeing the world in which I had travelled for a couple of days, then I looked up and you saw the horizon in all directions. Emptiness, space, freedom, with nothing between you and infinity, <coughs> in all directions. And the metaphor, the symbolism was so strong. When we have things like truth, meaning, infinity if you like, why is it that we always try and capture it with a photograph, capture it with words, and then we have arguments about it afterwards? Every emptiness, and emptiness wasn't scary, Emptiness was like freedom. It was like what surrounds and embraces and holds us all together, not what separates us. Just like when you come into this hall. When you come into this hall, what do you see? What do you recognize? The people, the, the sangha, the seats, walls, <coughs> the lights. 
But there's much more emptiness in this <coughs> hall than there are things. The space in this hall is mostly nothing. It's a space between people. Between the walls and the ceilings and the floor and all the other stuff we have here. <coughs> but we don't train ourselves to see what's between things. We only train ourselves to see what objects there are. So it's nice to be able to see things in a different way. The emptiness was not scary. The, the emptiness didn't need to be filled. The space was actually embracing, cool, and allowed you to see. So, I've got a lot of wonderful memories of going to that top of that pyramid. And I started to fantasize about hundreds of years beforehand, when that civilization was very active and alive. And there would be some sort of rite of passage to take a young boy or girl by the hand up to that pyramid for the very first time. And they could actually get up there and they could see, put everything in perspective. When they saw things in perspective, ah, oh, that's where that village is, ah, oh, now I know why that tree is there, now I know how everything works together. And many of the difficulties and problems in life, they all just, they're part of life. It's not like something has gone wrong. You understand how these all work together, all important. And also, you have this wonderful place of coolness, good air on top of the pyramid, oh, this feels so good. It's refreshing, energizing, healthy. And then also you have the great insights truth in all directions. There's nothing between you and truth, nothing to be afraid of. Just wherever you want to look, space, emptiness, freedom. So those are the sorts of things which I remember from that uh, adventure. It's worthwhile doing it just for that. And I, that's one of the reasons why I encourage retreats. A retreat is similar. You've left your <coughs> your home, your world, your business, your family, whatever it is. And you've climbed up this wonderful pyramid called meditation, retreats. And it's as if, you know, you, you may have resisted, but you go up and you, you leave your world. You're silent as best you can. And you're free as best you let yourself be free. And you go up there, number one, good air. You know, in life, in the family, in you know, business, so many things to do, even in a monastery. But sometimes there's so much stuff that, you know, it seems to be um, humid, compressed, stuffy. So sometimes it's nice to actually leave, go up your pyramid. And up there it's refreshing. So when you meditate, if you meditate properly, instead of trying to get something more of the same, Instead of just trying to remember all this stuff and figure it all out and fantasize and plan, just it should be freeing, just at last you can get some rest, fresh air, as it were, like on the top of the pyramid. And then you can look down, once you're up the top of that pyramid, fresh air, relaxed, recuperated, then you can look down on your life. This is a world in which I've been uh, going backwards and forwards from this village to that village along this. Uh, track and on that track, you get the bird's eye view of your life. You look upon them, that bird's eye view of your life and you find, wow, it's amazing. Just all this stuff which I thought was really hard at the time, it really had meaning. It had a purpose to it, because when it's too in front of you, you can't see it. But when you stand back, really stand back, in a pyramid above, all this stuff has amazing <laughs> meaning for you. <coughs> That's one of the problems with life, we think, why did this happen to me? Now, one of those um, uh, experiences I've had for a long time, again, is you know, working with the, uh, our local cancer support group. It's about 36 years now, I've been going there every year, and they've been coming to monastery where I live once a year too. And I couldn't understand because after 35 years, they sort of, uh, they got, a few million dollars from the local government and opened up this huge centre. They got a big grant for it. And 
They invited the, the Premier of Western Australia at the time and me as the two honorary guests. And I said, why me? You know that phrase, well, I'm, I didn't give anything here. The government, yeah, you've got to suck up to them because you know, they pay the bills. <coughs> but I don't pay anything. So why me? And then they told me this story of why they kept inviting me. Simple thing. There was um, one of the women there, she had breast cancer, I think she had a mastectomy, uh, radiation, chemotherapy, whatever it was. And it was really hard. You know, she got through it. She was in remission. Looked like the tumours had gone. But she had a big fear remaining. If the cancer comes back, she thought, I can't do this again. It's just too horrible. And so apparently, that she'd asked many uh, counsellors, psychologists, doctors, the same question when first went for the first time, she put her hand up to answer a question. Said, now I've been through hell with uh, my treatment. I'm now free of the cancer, but I'm so afraid. What would happen if the cancer came back? I know sometimes I say things that sometimes people get offended because they think I don't really respect them, but I just hit the nail on the head straight away. And I said, what would happen if it didn't come back? And she went silent. And that was the answer she was looking for. Why was she always so negative? Thinking that it may come back. And focusing on that. And then this bald-headed brown guy, and brown robes anyway, comes along and flippantly says, and it wasn't flippant, it was just um, serious. What happens if it didn't come back? And that just changed the way she looked at it. And so, the cancer never came back. But she came back for 35 years. So did I. And that's wonderful that you can just do something so simple. Change people's perceptions and attitudes. And then, problem is solved. Our negativity. And going there for such a long time, just uh, hearing so many people say, it was a really tough journey, a painful journey, a scary journey, going through cancer. But they tell me, and these are their words, I can't say this, I wouldn't have given that up for the world. That journey was so important to me. I learned and grew so much going through the cancer treatments. And they mean it. And that was actually quite challenging for me at first, but then of course you understand it. When you're right in the middle of it, you're in the jungle and it's just, you're lost, it's hot, it's painful, you don't know whether you're going to survive. You can't see the meaning of these things. But afterwards, or when you get out of that jungle, on your pyramid, then you can actually see this meaning. And it stuns you. Why? Why? Why this to me? I'm, why does it keep on happening? It's so painful, it's so awful. But then actually when you look back and see it, wow, the life was just so important that these things happened. If they didn't have happened, hadn't have happened, I would have missed out so much. It's amazing just how life has meaning when you can just stand back and look at it from a distance. Painful, but we call that growing pains. Unpleasant, but we call that dog shit. For your apple tree. <coughs> if you tread in the dog shit on your way home from this retreat, Please make sure you don't scrape it off your shoes. But don't take it in your house. Go around the back of a garden, it's not a garden, a public um, park or something, and scrape it off under a tree. Especially if it's an apple tree. Or, what other trees are you getting into here? Yeah. Raspberries, pears. Mm. Anyway, so anyway, scrape it off under your favourite tree, and then, a few 
months later, your apples or your pears become juicier and sweeter than ever. Incredibly juicy. Why? Because dog shit is an amazing fertilizer. But people just keep forgetting you know, that that dog shit, that pain, that trouble had a meaning and you used it wisely. You grew in compassion, kindness. And that's the simile is your apples are juicier than ever before. But people keep forgetting that when they bite into that apple and that sweet juice drips down your, your cheek, that what you just ate was dog shit. <laughs> Trans transform into the juiciest of apples. Just, of course it is, it's got to come from somewhere. That's where it comes from. And so understanding that gives you a perspective on some of the difficulties of life. When, you're up at, you, when it's right in front of you, you can't see it. When you stand back in your little pyramids, you can. So that's one of the reasons why we do have retreats. This is the best way you can find a little uh, pyramid to escape from your world, just temporarily, to get a different view, to relax, to find some peace, some good air, not to strive, not to do the same you do on down the bottom, and then you get some wonderful uh, experiences on how life works and how you work <coughs> and how little things like chasing so much stuff in this world, you miss out on life. When somebody, I think it was I think in the um, Rudolf Steiner Center when somebody challenged me, yeah but, 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 you know, you tell us to take it easy but we should really work hard in life. Work hard to get enough funds to get a house and uh, look after our kids and get a nice uh, uh, monastery for a venerable chanda. Drive, work hard, save up. But there was this story which I said at the time and I got a few ahs oh, out of the audience. And there was a story of the uh, five, six year old kid waiting for his father to come home. He was waiting for his father to come. His father finally came home from work. The little son said, Daddy, how much do you earn at the office? every hour. And this was actually Australia, because I have some idea of the, the race people are paid. And his dad had a good job and he said, <coughs> none of your business, I'm tired. And he said, Daddy, please, how many dollars do you earn at work per hour? Look, I said, it's none of your business. I've just really been busy and just, you no, stop it. But Daddy, how much that sip? I told you no twice. You know, up to your room, you're grounded. So the little kid had to trudge up to his room and go inside of his room. He was grounded. And just because he was just asking a simple question, but the father was so tired and exhausted after a day of work. He just wanted to have a cup of tea, put his feet up and just <coughs> relax. But then he started to think that it wasn't his darling son's fault, it was just because he was tired. When you're exhausted, you say some stupid things, things which you get regret afterwards. So he felt a lot of remorse. He went up to his son's room, knocked on the door, let himself in and said, I'm sorry, son. I was sorry I argued with you, I was shouted at you. It was just, I was tired, that's all. That's what happens when people get so stressed out, working, coming home through traffic, so difficult. And so he said, the, um, actually I earn $20 an hour at work, so I don't know why you want to know, but it's $20 an hour roughly. And he said, thank you, Daddy. Now can I please borrow $10? At which the father would usually say, no. But when you've already been angry at somebody once, you don't want to get angry at them again. So he bit his lip, opened his wallet and gave his little son a ten dollar note. And that's when his son smiled. Thank you, Daddy. He reached over to his bedside drawer 
and took out another ten dollars in coins, counted out twenty, gave it to his father, saying, Now, Daddy, can I have one hour of your time, please? <laughs> and sometimes I call that a story of our modern life. We work so hard as parents to try and get enough money to look after our kids, to make sure that they are happy when educated. But what do your kids really need? Just an hour of your time. And sometimes a kid has to pay for that. <laughs> Ooh, what a world we've got ourselves into. But if you go up and on a retreat, when you go back after the sour, you know, that's not the meaning of life. The meaning of life is to spend time with one another instead of having to pay for it. So anyway, then you learn a lot when you leave the world for a little while and just allow yourself to be peaceful. You don't need to think about it and be guilty. These things, they become obvious when you're up there on the top of the, the mountain, on top of the pyramid, on top in the retreat center. At last you've got time, time to allow the mind to figure things out. And the thinking just blocks. Why is the thinking blocking? Because one way of looking at the thoughts is like you're talking back at the world. Never, no, <coughs> in that internal speech, you're never listening to the world. Always interrupting with your ideas, with your opinions, with what we call thoughts. So, it's wonderful when you keep this external silence, the noble silence on this retreat, and even though there is only one day to go, only one day of silence, so please don't waste it, really value it. We don't have talking please here, we don't have um, CCTV cams like they have in London, recording every time you speak and giving you a black mark. Uh, <laughs> I remember a time when I was leading a pilgrimage to India many years ago to see the holy sites. And the, uh, the tour leader, she was very smart, she said, look, this is going to be very physically uncomfortable, not like you used to, these aren't paved roads, they're, they're dirt roads. And when we actually have to go to the toilet, it's in the fields. You know, so there aren't any public toilets, so you just have to squat down and, and get close to nature. And, but she said, many of you will probably be complaining. But what she did, very smart move, she put a big box in the front of the bus, a complaints box. It wasn't actually to write your complaints and put it in the box. It was every complaint will cost you ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the, at the, end of the, the pilgrimage we we'll give it to like a, a, a temple which was looking after, it was a Sri Lankan temple, which would had a free clinic and an orphanage a really good use of your, your fines <laughs> for complaining. <laughs> and we got a lot, big donation for that. Ten dollars here, ten dollars there. Oh, this road is just too... Oh, okay, ten bucks, here we go. There's one guy I remember, you might remember Casey Wong. He just, as soon as he heard about it, he said he put fifty dollars in for credit. <laughs> <laughs> he knew his character. <laughs> and he did try to negotiate. If I'd get you know, fifty dollars, can I get one free? <laughs> <laughs> the nature of nature of human beings. But anyway, <laughs> it is <laughs> uh, turning complaints into something wonderful because that's part of the journey. You know, it's doing things differently, seeing how other <coughs> things work. But when you're here, just why is it that? We've got another day left, day and a bit. So please value, value it. Don't pack your bags till the very last moment. Squeeze as much peace and silence and rest 
out of this retreat as you possibly can. So if you do that, we keep the silence, we have more time to listen when we're not talking. And when we're listening to our body, to life, what's that called? Mindfulness. We're aware, we're not throwing it away too easily. And when you're listening, not even directing what you're listening to, it's amazing just how insights and ideas and, and uh, skillful means come up. <coughs> you understand just how life works. You know sometimes, oh what is this about complaints? This, I read this in another book a long time ago, I can't remember who wrote the book. There was a lovely story about, it was a young American man who was backpacking through um, Europe now, quite a while ago. So in those days, <coughs> if you didn't have a guitar, <laughs> like that, he'd work in restaurants, you know, just washing up, serving tables. He didn't get paid very much, maybe you get a tip every now and again, but the great thing about working in restaurants, you get free food. If you're a young man just working through your way through Europe, just getting free food, that was, you know, saved you a lot of money. So he's working in this restaurant in Vienna and working really hard. And <coughs> that uh, one day the owner of the restaurant got all the staff together and said, uh, there was an administrative error. We've ordered too much sauerkraut. We got heaps of it. So, any of you who want free breakfast, free lunch, free dinner, has to be sauerkraut. We've got to get rid of it somehow. And if you want anything else, you have to pay for it. And this American thought, they can't do this to us. The deal was, you know, free food. I'm not eating sauerkraut every morning, lunch and dinner. You know, I'm not some sort of sauerkraut fetishist. I just wanted to have a proper meal. They can't do this to me. He got very upset and angry. It wasn't in the contract. It was wrong. He had a point. And at that time, when he was getting very angry, the cook came out. And the cook, you know, as an old fellow, he said, young man, I want you to teach you something. The dif difference between an irritation and a problem. And he said to this young American, he was sincere, so the American was listening to him. He said, ten years ago, I had a problem. I was in Auschwitz. When I woke up in the morning, I didn't know if I would go to sleep at night alive. Many of my friends, my loved ones, my families, never went to bed that night. They disappeared, they died. He said, being in Auschwitz, that is what I call a problem. Eating sauerkraut is an irritation. And that, that, that American understood. How much is it that sometimes we make irritations to be this huge, huge big problem? Please keep things in perspective. It's only an irritation. It's not a problem. <laughs> so, that really sort of helped me so much of my life. I was having irritations. They weren't really irritations. So, they were irritations. I made a problem out of them. I can't stand for this. This is wrong. We mustn't have this. this is, so please, know the difference between an irritation and a problem. If it's life-threatening, it's a problem. But if it's just a disturbance, somebody makes a funny sound during the meditation, what's going on? That's an irritation for you. It's not a problem. Keep it in perspective, for goodness sake. You get sort of sleepy. That's an irritation when you want to be awake. And when you go to sleep at night and you're awake, that's just an irritation, that's not a problem. Your body is fine. You have a cold and you sneeze. That's not a problem, that's an irritation. <laughs> you will not die because you have a cold. <laughs> In fact, it's a very good thing for you to have a cold because 
you are getting rid of all these toxins which come out with your snot <laughs> and it's a wonderful way of just um, letting go. <laughs> you know, once I, I, I was really close to Jaina once and, and, I, and I had a cold and I blew my nose. I was so close before I blew it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, these bad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> but I always remember if, uh, when I was a school teacher, we had to do, well, we actually actually asked a, that, that's, you know, I should have told you I was a school teacher before I became a monk. You learnt a lot from that, being a school teacher. Because you let the class come and sit wherever they wanted, like I let you sit wherever you want. So now I know who, who's teacher's pet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they will sit in the front. And I also know who the naughty kids are. <laughs> They're the ones who always sit in the back. <laughs> <laughs> it was true. They told me themselves who the naughty ones were, they sit in the back. <laughs> but anyway, one thing which, uh, I think because I had to do a bit of science, and so I remember <coughs> asking this GP, Come in, please, give us some quick first aid training. Because, you know, in those laboratories is concentrated acid. Sooner or later, some kid is going to be playing around and just uh, spills it over them. Some boy is going to actually put... Uh, actually, I remember this kid doing this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was at school. Just put in the, the pins of a um, compass into the... Uh, the electrics. Oh. <laughs> and getting this incredible, like, a spark, what was it called, a short. Really nice, really, really, really impressive. We, we thought it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> but some, they're going to sort of have accidents from that. Tell us what to do. <coughs> and I remember the one thing I got from this GP, so don't panic. Even if you see just this huge burn or this you know, half the, the skin coming off. Just look at him and say, oh, that's nothing, that'll be okay. There was one time he said, you should lie. Because he was telling me that it's panic, which creates most of the problem. It's when you have fear and anxiety, what is it, the, the blood vessels dilate, and when they dilate, that there's a low blood pressure or something, and then you get sort of the, the heart failures. It's like the fear is you know, one of the worst causes for, well it's not fear, it's uh, shock. shock, yeah. Shock <coughs> is what <coughs> causes many people's deaths. So when you learn how to be unshockable, <laughs> <laughs> so someone says, ah, oh, the person next door has gone crazy, and, oh yeah, okay, it's fine. When someone says, ah, oh, somebody's, their neck's fallen off, <laughs> oh yeah, fine. <laughs> when you're unshockable, you survive. <laughs> so, so a lot of times we learn how to have this wonderful attitude of, ah, oh, she'll be right. That's Australian. That's why they have the most efficient psychotherapists in Australia. You go into their consulting rooms and you get all sorts of problems and they say, ah, oh, She'll be right. No worries, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and you pay the bill. Very fast, very efficient. <laughs> but I don't know if you heard about the, the squirrel. The squirrel came into the psychologists. <laughs> and was on the couch. And the, the therapist said, well, what are you doing here? And the squirrel said, well, doc, ever since I, I read that you are what you eat, <laughs> I realised I was nuts. <laughs> oh, the dog? Oh, this guy. This guy came into the therapist <laughs> and said, what's your problem? He said, I know, I'm a dog. I know I'm a dog. I believe I'm a dog. And the therapist says, okay, that's not uncommon, so get on the couch. I'm not allowed. Laughter <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I've never done that one before. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get on this one. But anyway, um, so overreaction. Just like when you see limiters. Overreaction. Yes. Oh, ooh. You're overreacting. This is a limiter, that's all. Big deal. It's just limiters. It's charged. It's just enlightenment. Big deal. <laughs> when we overreact, that's when we spoil life. So we have this wonderful, peaceful, soft approach to life. If you can do that, that's actually one reason why I tell lots of jokes and funny stories on retreats. It really is good for your health. Because I read this, and I'm sure many people know, know this, that when you laugh, <coughs> your arteries expand. Well, your blood vessels, it, all of them, they expand when you laugh. When you get angry, shocked, fearful, your arteries contract. So, if you laugh a lot, you're very happy, your arteries and, and other blood vessels, they expand, they get very big. When you have very big arteries, it's much less likely they get congested with cholesterol and other stuff. So the more you laugh, the more you can eat. <laughs> without any risk of a heart attack, or stroke or anything. And I thought, once I went, oh, yes. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that only fat people are jolly people? <laughs> they are. Fat people are happy people. You never very rarely see a fat misery guts. <coughs> and it's a good reason for that. Because if you're fat, and you've got you know, lots of stuff going, and your misery, your blood vessels contract, lots of yuck, gut going through, of course it's going to clog. Just like the M25. <laughs> but, if you put an extra couple of lanes on the M25, <laughs> you can get all sorts of traffic coming through. And of course, it never gets a traffic jam. It flows freely, because it's nice and wide. <laughs> so if you do like, um, delicious food, which usually people say is unhealthy for you, make sure you laugh, and then it compensates. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you got insurance for bad advice on this <laughs> retreat? <laughs> <laughs> In case people eat too much of this, <laughs> and they die and I get into trouble. It doesn't really matter, because I'm leaving the country in a few days anyway. So that's <laughs> have you got an extradition treaty with, with uh, Australia, England. <laughs> so sometimes the importance of laughter even, when you leave the world and actually look at laughter, it's such an important part of being a human being. It's healthy and it's also part of spirituality, part of wisdom. It's amazing just when people don't laugh, <coughs> well, actually, when we do laugh, we tell a joke, we laugh together. It actually brings people together. <coughs> <coughs> Takes away this terrible seriousness of life, especially in relationships. You crack a joke together, and then you laugh together. You're in peace and harmony. Actually, you're laughing at the stupidity of life, and the fact that many people make mistakes, we do stupid things. So it makes it hard to blame one another. Instead, we look at one another and see our similarities, see human stupidities. That's our, our race, that's our species, and that understands we can make mistakes and we can laugh with them. Which means we don't need to call a lawyer in. Mm -hmm. Which means that we can have some more peace in life. All I'm saying today, actually, that's why. What is it? What's that type of Buddhism which I teach? It's not Theravada. It's not Mahayana. It's not Vajrayana. It's not Hinayana. <coughs> I try to bring everything together. I always like to have my synergy. And so I take the H 
from Hinayana. The aha from Mahayana. And the yana from Vajrayana. Put them all together and what does that spell? Hahayana. <laughs> I'm a follower of Hahayana. <laughs> <laughs> so are you now. <coughs> and if you really sort of develop that path to the maximum, you become what? A ha 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 do something stupid in front of the class and they start laughing. You laugh as well. Then the world never laughs at you. It only laughs with you. What a beautiful piece of advice that was. So, <coughs> little by little, you learn to bring joy into life. As you bring joy into life, you engage in life. The health in <coughs> The health improves, as you just see. (laughs) 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 And the the lightness, you don't carry so many things with you when you're laughing. It's easy to let go of stuff. Because what I'd say we can carry most of all is the negative stuff. The laughter frees us. Then after a while, we have so much joy. We can close our eyes. It is so easy to be peaceful. The inspiration of joy. And that was one of the great insights which, just to share with you, this is the deep stuff. It's all deep stuff. But anyway, this was really powerful. Because whenever you have an inspiring session, it could be compassion, wisdom, laughter, you feel good after the talk or after the meditation or after the interviews or whatever it is. You really get into it. Even just the, the chanting in the morning with the three big sadhus. Sometimes it really wakes you up, inspires you. And afterwards you sit in meditation, it's easy to be peaceful. I did mention that sometimes Ajahn Chai gave boring talks but sometimes were well, just brilliant. I don't know why, sometimes not the words maybe, but where it came from. (coughs) On this occasion, he gave one of the most beautiful talks. Uh, This was at Wat Nana Chat in Thailand. And amazing talk. And afterwards he went off to have a sauna. We built a sauna for him. Actually it wasn't really built for him to be honest, it was built for us. (laughs) <laughs> it was an excuse to get our teacher to come every week for his sauna, but really to give us a talk. And it was such a beautiful, beautiful talk. And it's usually your duties, you know, to your teacher, to look after them. And for me that meant just, you know, going to the sauna, uh, washing his, um, uh, got bathing cloth, making sure he had everything he needed. But that day, it was just a beautiful talk. There's so many other monks to do that duty. So I just went to the side of the hall where it was quiet, and sat down for two hours and just blissed out. You'll find it so easy to get deep meditation, even jhanas, when you're happy, when you're inspired. In fact, there's one of my favorite sayings in, in Pali, Suki no Jitang samadhi From happiness, the mind becomes still. Sukhino is important. From happiness. Not the happiness of just exuberance, but the happiness of just being satisfied. The human mind needs the food of happiness. If you don't find happiness in meditation, you'll find it somewhere else. TVs, travel or somewhere. So if you get the happiness from something really pure, such as a great Dhamma talk, oh, so easy, you close your eyes and just hardly any hindrances. So for two hours blissing out, 
<coughs> after a great talk. And then I went to see if I could find Ajahn Shah to actually to do some services. I was too late. He did a great service to me. Because we were going to cross on the path. There was no U-turn possible. So we were going to pass one another. And that's why, you know, you have to be honest that Ajahn Chah could read minds. Because my mind was so peaceful, so pure after a good meditation. For once my mind was ready to read. I didn't mind at all. Come in. And that's what it actually felt like. You know, not being, uh, you don't usually tell about your own uh, attainments or whatever, but that Ajahn Chah, he was <coughs> the real deal. And he looked at me. And there's no other way you can explain sort of personal experiences, but you know, I let him come inside. You actually feel him, you know, looking inside your head. And of course, I was actually, for once, quite proud to respect in my private quarters. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, have a look over here. This is really nice over here. <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards, you know, he, he looked to me. Why don't you check me out? <coughs> really kind, but really fierce at the same time, like holding you out of kindness but really strong. He said, Brahma Wangsa, why? What a wonderful event that was. My great teacher, when I was ready for some deep teachings, not messing around, just ask the question, why? Get to the point, why? And I answered with solemnity. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I admitted I was a stupid monk. You know, with all these degrees and stuff, they meant nothing. That was really embarrassing, you know. <coughs> Getting sort of a great degree from a great university. And here's this Ajahn Chah, only four years at school. And he's way, 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 way wiser than I was. Sometimes I thought, you know, please excuse me, but what a waste of time that education was. When it comes to real life and just being wise and able to, to deal with life. But Ajahn Shah was way, way ahead of any professor. But anyway, I said, I don't know. And the nice thing about um, uh, really great enlightened monks and nuns is they never criticize you. They just think it's so funny. He laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> Ajahn Chah. <coughs> and then you're thinking to us, oh, big idiot. But at least I realised that my stupidity was the source of so much laughter to my teacher. <laughs> and I thought at least I would do one service for him. <laughs> and then he stopped laughing and looked at me again. The Brahma works up. I'll tell you the answer. Oh, now this is really is interesting. I didn't need to know he was going to tell it for me. With such compassion. And I was really listening. He told me the answer. <coughs> Brahma works up. Anyone ask you that question again? Why? This is the answer. Are you interested? I was really interested. I was fascinated. I couldn't wait for him to say something. And he said, the answer is, there's nothing. There's nothing. And he looked at me again and said, do you understand? <laughs> and I said, yes. He said, no you don't. <laughs> and then he walked away. <laughs> I felt so insignificant. Just like one of the little ads crawling on the ground. <laughs> but at the same time, I felt very blessed having a great teacher like that who just put this seed in my head. Ooh, that was powerful. It's not so much joy and so much kindness and even drama. You know. Why? There's <coughs> nothing. Oh, what a relief. 
to realize there's nothing. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> oh.